Hi, and welcome back to our series Backgammon Basics here on Drag the Bar. I'm Bill Roberti, your instructor for the series. Now last time in episode two, we went through a real game from start to finish. You saw the power of taking some small chances early on to build the really vital points that could give you control of the board in the middle game. Black took appropriate risks, took control of the game, while white played passively, and pretty soon found himself backed into a corner. Now that's typical of what happens in a lot of games where one player appreciates the power of taking small risks early, while his opponent tries to play safe and then later on gets crushed. In this episode, we're going to take a look at how to play the 15 possible opening roles. By the time we finish, you're going to know how to start the game no matter what role you throw. Some opening roles are very strong, but there are really no bad opening roles, just bad ways of playing them. Now remember that you'll never have to play a double on your opening roll because the game starts with each player throwing one die and the player with the higher die moves first. If the players happen to throw the same number, they just roll over until the dice show two different numbers. Then one player takes over and the player who threw the larger number takes over and plays that role. Okay, enough review on that. Let's get started. Now we're going to start with what are called the forced rolls. And these are rolls where they're, the roll is so good that there's just no other way really of playing it. And we'll take a look at the very best of the, for, the forced rolls, which is what happens when black starts the game with a 3-1. Now the only way you want to play a 3-1 on the opening is to make your 5 point by going 8-5 to five with the 3 and then covering that with 6-5 to five with the 1. The reason this roll is so good is because you've made you not only have made a new point, but you've made a point which starts to block in your opponent. Notice that before these two back men here of whites couldn't play a five because they were blocked. Well, now they can't play a four or a five because they're blocked. So you've made a good point. You've made a blocking point, and most important of all, you've made an inner board point. And the reason inner board points are so good is because they serve two functions. They not only help to block in your opponent, but if you manage to hit a checker later on in the game, that inner board point is going to help keep your opponent on the bar, keep them unable to come in, and that's much stronger than having an outer board point. So with an opening 3-1, that's actually your very best opening roll, and you're always going to use it to make your 5 point. Now the next opening roll we want to look at is the second best opening roll, and that's a 4-2. And really the play is exactly analogous to the play with a 3-1. This time we're going to take a checker from our 8 point, move it 4 pips ahead, and then we're going to take a checker on the 6 point, move it 2 pips, make that point. So we've used it to make our 4 point. This is good for all the reasons that the 3-1 was good, namely we've made an inner point, we've made a blocking point. It's not quite as good as the 3-1 only because the 4 isn't right next to the 6 point. We've, less, we've left this gap in here on the 5 and there's some possibility that in the future White's going to be able to get his two back men up and make the 5 point on his own, which will largely neutralize the strength of the 4 point. That's a small matter. 4-2 is an excellent roll, but it's not quite as good as a 3-1, which made two points back-to-back -back and prevented White from getting in between them. Okay, now the next of the forced plays that we'll take a peek at is 5-3, and by now you can probably guess how we're going to play this. We'll take a checker off the 8, move it 5 pips forward to the 3-point, and then we'll take a checker off the 6 and move that 3 pips forward, so we'll use it to make the 3 point. Now, this is still a good opening roll because we have made an inner board point, but notice that the point is now far enough down in our board that it doesn't have an awful lot of blocking value. It's not hard for White to start moving his back man and get beyond the 3 point and try to make an anchor in this area here on the 4 and the 5. So the 5-3 play doesn't have that blocking strength, but it's still an inner point, and it's still a pretty good point to make. 
Now, this is an idea that really has only clarified in the last 20 years or so. Uh, if you played backgammon in the 1970s, you would have seen a different way of playing an opening 5-3. Players would have taken two checkers off their midpoint, and they would have moved the 5 to the 8 point and the 3 to the 10 point. And the reason, the logic behind that role is they very much wanted to make the 4, the 5, and the 7 as their first objects in the game. So they would pass up a chance for the 3 and get another builder in position to try to make one of these super strong points. Nowadays, we think that's an idea, but we don't think it's as good as simply locking up a good point to start the game. So that move isn't seen very often except uh, maybe by some old timers. Uh, but 30 years ago, that was the way a 5-3 was played. Now our next opening roll is a little different. Uh, the next opening roll we'll look at is the roll of 6-1. Now this is a pretty good shot. It's considered to be about as strong as opening the game with a 4-2, but it does something a little different. With a 6-1, you're going to take a checker from your midpoint, your 13 point, and move that 6 pips forward down to the 7. Then you're going to take a checker from the 8 point and move that 1 and make your 7 point, which is also known as your bar point. Now, this is a pretty good roll. It makes a new point, of course, which is always good. And it sets up uh, a block. It sets up three consecutive points in a row. Now, in backgammon, we call consecutive points primes. And primes are very strong. If you can make five in a row, you've got a tremendous edge. If you can make six in a row, you've almost certainly won the game. So we like to build consecutive points. The drawback of the move, even though you do get five points in a row, is that you didn't make an inner board point, And you also didn't start to take your checkers off the six point here, which is another key goal, unstacking these big stacks that you have at the start of the game. So it falls down a little on those counts, but it still makes a good blocking point, so it's still considered a very good opening roll. And now we're going to move on and take a look at the last of our so-called forced opening rolls. Uh, and this is the roll of 6-5. Now, this is completely different from all the others because we can't use this to make a point, but we can do something pretty good with it. We can take one of our back checkers on the 24 point and move it 6 pips forward to the 18, and then we can keep it going move it five more pips forward until it finally stops on the 13. Uh, this is the only opening roll that actually has a name. It's called Lover's Leap. That goes back centuries, who knows why. Um, but that's what it's called. This is Lover's Leap, and it's a roll that fulfills one of your opening objectives, which is to escape your back checkers from inside your opponent's home board. In this case, we got one checker all the way out to the midpoint. It's a modest accomplishment. We didn't make a new point. We still have a checker left back there. But there's no other good way to play the role, so this is what you do with it. And now that wraps up um, all of the roles that are considered forced. Now we're going to start to take a look at a new bunch uh, which aren't forced, but where you have two or three alternatives, all of which are reasonable. OK, now the next three roles we're going to take a look at are the rolls that contain a 6 that we haven't uh, looked at already, which are 6-2, 6-3, and 6-4. So let's start with 6-2. Now, this is interesting because there's actually three different ways to play this number. Um, and you'll find people who like each one of the plays for some reason, but uh, there is a play here which I think is best, but it's, it's not as clearly best as the forced plays were, in which you had really only one clear choice. Um, one way you could play a 6-2, and you'll sometimes especially see beginners do this, is to take the checker, one checker on the 24 point and move him all the way out to the 16 point use the entire roll to move him eight pips. And this is basically a running move. You're trying to escape this checker. You're hoping that white doesn't roll a four next turn and send it back. And you're just hoping to get this checker out next turn, maybe to the safety of your outer board. It's a reasonable play. It's not the sharpest or the most dynamic, but there's nothing really wrong with it. 
uh, there's a super aggressive way to play the 6-2 and again this move was very popular in the 1970s and that is to take one of the checkers on your midpoint and move that 8 pips all the way down to your 5. The idea here is that again you're hoping white doesn't roll a 4 and hit you and if he doesn't hit you maybe you'll be able to cover the 5 next turn with a 1 or a 3 or an 8 and make the 5 point which we know is very valuable. That's an aggressive play. It comes with a lot of risk, but again, you'll see players who like that choice. Now, my favorite play with a 6-2 is a little bit of both. Uh, I like to take one of the checkers on the 24 point and move him six pips out to the 18, and then leave him there. And then with the two, take one of the checkers on the 13 and move it down to the 11. Now this is a play that does a little bit of everything. It's very balanced. It's, it's good for defense because I'm now threatening to make the 18 point, which would be a very good anchor, a very good landing spot for my checkers later on in the game, and a bulwark that would prevent white from ever blocking me in. At the same time, this blot here on the 11 point threatens to help my other checkers make, let's say, the 5 point and the 7 point in the future. So it's a play that does a lot of different things. Uh, it develops my game very nicely. It starts to get off the stack on the midpoint, and it threatens to make a good advanced anchor. Those are all good things. Of course, there's some risk involved. Uh, white could roll either a 6 or a 1 and hit this checker on the 18 and send me back to the bar. But if he does that, unless he rolls something really perfect, uh, I'm going to have a lot of ways to re-enter and hit that blot and gain some ground in the race. So this play takes some risk, but it offers some pretty good rewards, and that's my favorite way of playing a 6-2. Now the next roll to look at is a 6-3, very similar. Um, this time there are only really a couple of different ways to play it. Uh, there's the simple running play. We take a checker on the 24, we move it six pips to the 18, and then we move it three more pips to the 15. So we've played a back checker nine pips, we've used our whole roll, and the idea of this move obviously is to just get this checker out, hope white doesn't hit it, and then bring it around to my outer board next turn. As with the 6-2, the play that I like is a little different. It involves moving the 6 out to the 18, as I did with the 6-2, and then pulling a checker down from the midpoint with a 3, creating another builder to work on the 4-point, the 5-point, and the 7-point. I like this for exactly the same reason I like the similar play with 6-2. I start to make an advanced anchor, I start to get more building, I take some risk, but I'm not taking an awful lot of risk. So again, this is my preference here. And now the last of the six rolls that we'll look at is the roll of 6-4. And again, there's several ways to play this number. Uh, first of all, there's the straight racing play where you take a checker from the 24 point and you move it all the way out 10 pips to the 14. And that's a good racing roll. In fact, White has fewer ways to hit this blot than he's had in the last two examples to hit the other blots. He can only hit it with exactly a two on the dice. So this is relatively a pretty safe way. It's almost as good as a 6-5 in terms of escaping a checker. A second way, completely different way to play a 6-4, is to take one checker from your eight point and move it six pips down to the two and then take a checker from your six point and move it four pips and make the two point. Um, this is an aggressive play. You've made an inner point. You, it's good if you eventually hit white later on, but the point really doesn't help you form part of a prime. So it's more a sort of play that you would use in situations where you had to win a gamut. The third way of playing the 6-4, again, just analogous to the first two is to use the six to come out to the 18 point and then use the four to come down from 13 to nine and again you get a good it's a good defensive play because you're trying to make the 18 point quickly uh, it's also a good offensive play because the builder on the nine point 
gives you a lot of new numbers to try to make the three, four, five, or seven points very quickly. So it's a balanced play. It works on both sides of the board. And that's my preferred way of starting a game with a 6-4. Now that covers the whole batch of rolls that begin with a 6. And next we're going to take a look at rolls that can be used to build your position in various ways without too much risk. Now let's take a look at the first of these uh, various building roles that we want to look at and it's the role of 4-3. Now 4-3 is an interesting role. There are a lot of different ways to play it. Um, they all have some merit with one exception. Let's start off and take a look at a way that we're never going to play this role and that would be completely safe. You could take a checker off the 13 move it seven pips and put it on the sixth point, giving you a stack of six checkers there. Uh, this play is completely safe and completely hopeless. Uh, you can't make any progress in the early part of a backgammon game just stacking up your checkers. That safety you, that you're getting is an illusion because later on when your checkers get into awkward positions and you have to leave blots, it's going to be much more dangerous to leave blots later than it is on the opening roll. So let's completely forget about that and take another look at some of the different ways we can play this that are effective. Now here's the first way we'll look at. Take two checkers off the 13 point and put them down here on the 9 and the 10. Now this looks a little dangerous, a little exposed. You're leaving two blots. The checker on the 9 point can be hit by any 8 from white Checker on the 10 point can be hit by any 9. However, that's a, that's a substantial minority of white's rolls. And if white doesn't roll an 8 or a 9, black has tremendous opportunity to build good points next turn. Virtually all his rolls are either going to make the 5 point, the 4 point, or the 7 point. So he's in tremendous shape to improve the front part of his game and start to make a prime. However, that's only one choice. Now let's take a look at a couple of others which have a slightly different idea. First of all, let's see what happens if we play one checker from the 13 point down four pips to the nine point. And then with the three, instead of pulling down another checker, instead we split our back men by moving from 24 to 21. Now this is actually my personal favorite among the three. It, it's a balanced kind of play. It gives you the chance to establish a good defensive anchor later on and it also gives you quite a bit of building opportunity anyway. So that's a very nice move. Uh, there's another move you can make. It's closely related to this and it involves moving one of the back checkers four pips from 24 to 20 and then moving a checker down three pips from the 13 point. Gets a little different structure. You don't have quite as many building rolls on this side of the board because there's a little bit of duplication involved. For example, if uh, black rolls a 3-1 next turn, notice he could make the bar point, but a better play is to make the five point. But even so, he's duplicated that number a little bit. As compensation, uh, by splitting to the 20 point, black is threatening to make the best point in white's inner board. So this is also a good play. It's not really inferior to the other. Uh, just a matter of style, really, which of those you prefer. And a fourth way to play it is what's called the Middle Eastern version. And that's where you take both checkers on the 24 point and you move them up to the 21 and the 20 point. Now this play is all defense. Uh, Black is really trying very hard to just make an anchor here by slotting both these points, hoping for a one next turn, hoping to control White's outer board a little. You, if you play backgammon in the Middle East or against people from Middle Eastern descent, uh, the game very much revolves around trying to win the race, and you'll see this play with a 4-3 quite a bit. So those are your basic choices. Um, they're all decent. Um, like I say, I, my own personal favorite is to play the four down to the nine and to split with the three and back. But playing two men down is perfectly okay and splitting with the four and back also perfectly okay. 
Now the next of the building roles that we're going to look at is a close relative to the 4-3. It's the 3-2 roll. And uh, here there's only really a couple of different uh, ways that you'll see this played. Now as before with the 4-3, we immediately reject the Craven 13-8, just trying to stack up your checkers and play safe. As I say, that's a hopeless way to play in the opening. If you see someone start off a game by making plays like that, you know you have a fish and that's somebody you want to play for money as much as you can. The most common way to play this role, uh, the play that I like a little, I like the best really, is to take two men off the midpoint and put them on the 10 point and the 11 point. Now the advantage of the play is obvious, it gives you tremendous building potential next turn. The downside is also pretty obvious that you've got two blots and white can hit you with a 9 or a 10. But there aren't many 9s and 10s on the dice, so that's really not something you're worried about a whole lot. And a second way to play the number, which is really equally good, again, just a matter of style, is to split the back bend with the 3 and with the 2 to play the checker down from 13 to 11. This gives you some extra building opportunity plus a chance to make a defensive anchor. So again, you're balancing your game, you're playing on both sides of the board, nothing wrong with that at all. So either of those are perfectly good ways to start off with a 3-2. Now the next of our building roles is 5-4. Uh, again, there's a couple of choices here. They're pretty close but master opinion pretty strongly favors one over the other. Uh, the play that you'll see most top players make with this roll is to split the back checkers with the four and then with the five to play a checker down to the eight point. This prepares to make the 20 point a great defensive anchor and doesn't do much on this side of the board. The extra checker on the eight point is perhaps only a little bit of a help but it does smooth out black's distribution a little bit. But the main uh, merit of the move is that black is trying very hard to make the anchor on the 20 point as soon as he can. Now the other way to play the role is to make the same play of the 5, but instead to use the 4 to play down to the 9 point. This is okay. Uh, there's nothing really wrong with it, but commonly you'll just, you'll just see players nowadays more likely trying to get the advanced anchor uh, as opposed to taking another checker off the midpoint. So that's a little rare. You'll see it once in a while. And finally, the last of our building roles is the 5-2 roll. Uh, this really isn't a, a great roll, um, but here's how it's played. Uh, the 5 is more or less forced. You're not going to be able to play the 5 on the other side of the board, even if you split uh, to the 22 point. Uh, this checker is blocked from moving 5 anyway. So the 5 is going to be played 13 to 8. And then there's a couple of plays with the 2 that are completely reasonable. There's the more straightforward building play of 13 to 11, which gives you some extra combinations to make the five point and the seven point. And there's the splitting play 24-22. It's not as good as the other splits we've looked at because black is only threatening to make the 22 point, which is not a very high defensive anchor. It's not as good for black as making the 21 point or the 20 or the 18, which are all really premium anchors. Uh, but neither of these plays really dominates the other. Um, more often than not, I play the split here, but I don't really have a strong preference, and I don't think most other good players do either. So you can split with a 22, or you can play 13 to 11. Uh, either one is going to work out about the same. Now the last group of roles we're going to take a look at are the roles that contain an ace but don't make a point. And those are 2-1, 4-1, and 5-1. And they have some interesting problems of their own that we haven't seen thus far. So let's start with 2-1 and take a look at that. Now, one way to play this is a pretty safe role, pretty safe way. Play the 2 from 13 to 11. 
which gives you a little building opportunity over here and diversifies because you take a checker off the stack on the midpoint. And then with the ace just split from 24 to 23. Now that's a pretty modest split and what that's really trying to do is to make sure that you've got very good coverage here of the outer board so that white on his turn is restrained a little from playing checkers down and leaving blots here because you'll now have twice the number of hitting numbers that you had before. So this is kind of a safe restraining play. Black's not taking a lot of risk in the race but his checkers are in a perfectly reasonable position to make some progress next turn. Now a second way to play it, which is much more aggressive, um, is to take the chance and play a checker from the 6 to the 5. Now this is what we call a slot. Uh, slot means that you, you take a checker, you stick it on a point you want to make, you hope your opponent doesn't hit it, and then you plan on covering it next turn and coming away with a really valuable point. Uh, so when black makes this play, he's hoping that white doesn't roll a four, and then next turn he's in great position to cover with a six, a three, or a one. Uh, it's a good aggressive play. It's been the most popular way of playing a two-one for a long time. Uh, I like it, and this is generally how I'll start the game with a two-one. The five point is so important that you're willing to take some small risks to make it. This is a little more than a small risk, but it's an acceptable risk. And you'll see a lot of players do this. Now, a second roll is the roll of 4-1. And 4-1 is pretty similar to 2-1, um, but it, there's a little bit of a change here. Uh, with the 4, black is going to play 13 down to 9. And from the 9 point, he's got a lot of ways to make a point in here next turn. And with the ace, let's first look at the split. Now, with the 4-1, this is actually the way almost everyone plays it nowadays. And you might well ask, well, what's wrong with slotting like we did with the 2-1? So let's take a little closer look at that. Uh, this play used to be very popular. This used to be the way that people played 4-1, but they don't do it anymore. And the reason is kind of interesting. Uh, when you slot here with an ace, what you're really trying to do is accelerate the making of key points. You're saying basically, I want my good blocking points quickly. I want them so much I'm willing to take the risk of being hit with a 4 and stick a checker right here. But if you notice what happens after you've played the 4 from 13 down to 9, it turns out that almost all your numbers are making good points next turn anyway. Take a look at it. You have to make the 7 point, you can do it with 6-1 or 2-1 or 6-2. To make the 5 point, you can do that with 3-1 or 4-1 or 4-3. Then you can make the 4 point with 4-2 or 5-2 or 5-4. And finally, you can even make the 3 point with a whole bunch of other numbers like 5-3, 6-3, and 6-5. So in fact, it's very, very hard to find numbers for black that don't make good points next turn. And because black has so many numbers working for him, most players feel it's not worth taking any extra risk to try to make the five point in particular because you're almost surely going to make something good next turn with no more risk than you've already expended. So with 4-1, the most common play is 13 to 9 and then the sort of default splitting play 24-23. And then that brings us to the last roll that involves an ace which is 5-1 and with 5-1 it works a little bit like 4-1. People are going to play the 5 from 13 to 8. And again, they, they think that the playing the ace from 24 to 23 is a little better than playing it from 6 to 5. But it's, it's only a little better. You'll see some players playing 6 to 5, but the most common way is going to be 24 to 23. Okay, so that's it. We've now seen how to play all 15 of the possible opening rolls. Now some of these roles were pretty much forced, while some of the others gave you a little scope for imagination. 
But remember that no matter what you roll on the opening roll, it's never right to make a completely passive play in the opening. Every good choice that we looked at involved taking some risk to start building up your position, making a prime, or trying to get a good defensive anchor. And remember, for on, if you want to try online backgammon, be sure to try the site Black Chip Poker, which is part of the Merge Network. They do accept American players, and you can sign up through the My Account page here on Drag the Bar. And be sure to sign up for Rakeback when you join. Now, in the next episode, we're going to take a look at another complete game. Uh, this game will be an example of a type of game plan known as a blitz, where one side tries to close out his opponent right from the beginning, hoping for a quick knockout and an easy gammon. It's a very important game type, and if you can recognize it quickly and exploit it, you're going to be able to score a lot of easy wins and gammons against unsuspecting opponents. So until then, this is Bill Roberti signing off for Drag the Bar.